I don't ever want you to feel like I'm forcing you to forgive me. I truly am sorry. There are no excuses for it. We need to talk. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I messed up. Sorry. Accountability is a topic of discussion bound to come up when assessing internet gossip. When you make a mistake, it's guaranteed that people will want you to own up to them. No matter who you are or what you do, you may make a mistake at some point and the easiest way to get out of it is by holding yourself and others accountable. However, that's unfortunately not always the case. Sometimes people may either completely ignore your apology or will continue to spread misinformation about you. Similarly, often people will not be able to hold themselves accountable to address their own mistakes while constantly doing it with others. Tonight I recommend you set out your liabilities, grab a beverage, and maybe even a couple of newspaper articles because we're going to be delving into the facade of YouTubers taking accountability. I never want anything to get in the way of that, and I'm sorry if I've let you down, and things like that won't happen again. I was too ashamed to even think. It's finally time that I take accountability. This woman constantly will point at someone else's wrongdoings and expose it as much as possible, but when somebody does it back to her, all of a sudden, she's encouraging her fans to mass report the comment. And it was dumb, and I am sorry. The disrespect was on another level. I didn't hear the word sorry in that apology though. Hold yourself accountable to the same standards that you hold everybody else. Demands accountability from others, but she can't hold herself to those same standards. Standards, 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 standards. Alright, how's it going lads? It's the self-aggrandizing stick figure, here to complete a degree in accounting by making this boring video. Over the past years that I've been making a mess on this platform, and the years before of which I was simply an onlooker of internet drama, I've noticed a fair few people get cancelled or called out. Some have been perfectly reasonable, others were completely unfounded, and few were simply disproportionately exaggerated despite being pretty insignificant. However, regardless of what actually happens, they often have one key similarity. In any piece of internet drama, the most interesting interesting part is generally less such of what the dreaded mischievous individual did, and more on the fallout of the situation or how they respond. Generally, the bit of the drama that gets people rallied up is not the act in and of itself, but rather how poorly the community and or the creators handle the situation following the incident. Whether the creator or the people scrutinising the creator actually take accountability. People in the audience and creators alike often feel validated and feel that they're fighting a noble cause and getting the morally ambiguous to own up to their mistakes. However, the issue really begins to stream in when you consider that accountability is a buzzword used a ton on the internet with very little underlying meaning at this stage. It's used possibly more so at this point than any other typical buzzwords such as sociopath or cringe. The leading cause of the word being overused is mainly because of the amount of internet drama that goes on. As soon as somebody does something slightly immoral, the audience immediately resorts to saying, just take accountability, when they have nothing else to add. And or the reason this is used so much is because it's a lovely and simply packaged way of saying that you should own up to your mistakes. The problem with this word is that it's become somewhat redundant over time. Gradually, people have begun to not actually care about the act of taking accountability, and instead use it as a verbal phrase to one-up the person they're criticising. Commonly saying, if you take accountability for your actions, then we can move on, when that really isn't the case, is it? On the surface, it generally is somewhat of a noble cause. It can be quite wholesome to see people band together in support of one another to correct the record, right the wrong, or bring justice to those affected. However, if you've kept up with almost any situation over recent years, especially in regards to Chris Hansen, H383 and James Charles, you would know it's not always black and white. There are no heroes and villains on the internet, and often people could be reprehensible whilst their detractors are also rather morally ambiguous. A lot of the time, people ignore the original cause of trying to get the person to own up to said mistakes and sort of forget their good intentions, <laughs> leading to them posting somewhat defamatory content on different persons. This is where the redundancy truly begins. Due to this line of dialogue, people will learn something outrageous in regards to a particular internet user, and then will develop a subconscious hatred for them. I'm no psychiatrist, so I can't make a judgement for everybody on the internet, however often, people learn something bad about another, and then become willing to listen to almost any other point against them regardless of how valid or invalid, because the internet has chosen them as a target. Hence 
Hence, it is very difficult to have a nuanced opinion on somebody like Creepshow Art's editor when they share their experiences with Shannon. It could well be valid, but you shouldn't immediately believe it just because it's a video on somebody you don't like. This isn't only in Shannon's case, by the way, just saying. <laughs> As somewhat addressed in my commentary effect video a few years ago, people might dislike a lol cow such as that vegan teacher, because she occasionally uploads obtuse content on her TikTok. Due to this, anytime she sneezes, it's another 523.5 videos on her approximately. It doesn't matter whether what she did was morally reprehensible or not, they just want to shovel up dirt on her. Anyway, commentators and T-channels covering this sort of thing know that the audience dislikes an individual, so they know that anything somebody somewhere could interpret as morally wrong would be a great video topic. Suddenly, because of this pattern, hundreds of slightly hypocritical and poorly researched videos pop up on this hypothetical creator due to the hatred that many people in the audience develop. The video can be on a horrible deviant, but if it's spreading misinformation about them, it's still misinformation at the end of the day. Let's look at Anision for example. One of the hot topics of 2020 was how bad of a person Anision was. It was such a wild year that we had Chris Hansen jumping in on the case, as much as he's appeared to have messed that one up. <laughs> and people were quite literally building their entire careers off of talking about The Onion, as they called him. One person in particular, that had definitely not taken some sort of substance before joining Chris Hansen's show, even went as far as to claim that Anision was the cause of people starving themselves to death. Why, you might be asking? because he was vegan. <coughs> but regardless, not only was she kept on the show after that statement, but people began to believe it. Even our main man Chris acted as though she had just brought up a reasonable criticism of Anision. Now when you say starve yourself to death, people didn't actually die. No, they died. Tell me about that case. If this point had been made about anybody other than Greg, or recently Eugenia Cooney as well, people would have immediately discounted the point and laughed at it. <laughs> but because it's so awesome to see the person you dislike look even worse, no matter how wrong it is, people love watching it play out and see absolutely no problem with it. There are so many things that you could criticize Anision for, but it's amusing to me that there were more genuine criticisms against him found on the Kill stream, yes, the show hosted by this bloke, than on any of Hanson's streams. People would focus on the most insanely small things to go after Anision for that they would never have considered arguing if it were anybody else. Such as saying that Anision is the reason for giving somebody nightmares. This post right here indicates a woman is having nightmares about Onision content. She has never directly contacted him, but was influenced in her formative years. If this point had been made against somebody with the likes of Captain Sparkles, it would have been laughed off and nobody would have even taken it seriously. But because they don't like Anision, there is no possible way that this specific post made on Reddit could be a bad take. But maybe I'm not being controversial enough here. I mean, at this point everybody seems to know that both Anision and his main detractors are not the kind of people you'd like to be having a coffee with. So, on a sort of similar note, we have two individuals that I would totally not be biased about in any way, shape, or form. Dream and John Swan. <laughs> Obviously ignoring any of the other conflicts they've had and using these two as isolated incidents, both people lied for months and caused a rather large fallout because of it. Both John's little fib and Dream's little cheat are rather well known. If you know, you know. If you don't know, a short summary would be that Dream cheated on Minecraft and intentionally lied about it after realising that he had accidentally cheated. I addressed the conflict quite heavily in my video on Dream. The only difference is that he has now owned up to the cheating, which I wish I could show you, but he's now deleted his apology. In John's case, he and the content creator LT Cobra were messing around with a small new YouTuber that they thought was annoying and pretended to be Dream throughout it. John lied to Dream saying that he didn't do it, and it escalated from there until it all came crashing down. Both Dream and John Swan did pretty much a similar thing. One could argue the effects of one or the other was greater slash deeper, but overall their actions were very similar. Both parties caused their friends to turn against each other, and both seemed to cause some sort of nuclear fallout. <laughs> Yet regardless, people seem to think that one is redeemable and not the other. Those that think Dream is redeemable and not John because it was just a Minecraft speedrun are ignoring that John just trolled a small YouTuber and lied about it. Those that think John is redeemable and not Dream because Dream wrote a huge document are probably forgetting about John's documents. If they say John's not redeemable because I and several others were quote harassed because of him then you're probably missing the point that multiple members of the speedrunning moderation team had their families put in danger because of Dream's lies. If you think John's redeemable and Dream isn't because Dream deleted his 
apology the day after posting it, John pretty much did that too when he deactivated his account. There are hundreds of things you could criticise Dream for, and hundreds of things you could criticise John for. Both people, I'm sure, have heard quite a lot of those criticisms. But at the end of the day, they both made a petty little lie, and it escalated to a ridiculous level. Regardless of this, two very distinct groups decide to constantly hold one accountable, but ignore the other. People will say that John is a sociopathic liar and does not deserve any sort of platform, and then will go out to point out that Dream deserves a redemption. Because they don't like John, he isn't given a chance to rebuild his platform. Dream, on the other hand, is given a huge pass. It's all to do with the person and how much the community likes them. This entire paragraph could be said vice versa, just with a few edits. Let me clarify for those of you that do think I am genuinely being biased here, I don't think Dream is a bad guy. I think people calling for his channel to be deleted, complaining about his existence, and or mocking anybody that says they watch Dream are just about as cool as their school teachers say they are. Not very. However, it is very interesting to me that both John and Dream did something very similar, yet both have groups that think they can be redeemed, and both have groups thinking that they can't. To be clear, the select few that feel that neither can be redeemed are also fair, and the select few that think both can be redeemed are me. <laughs> While we're talking about my stick man friend here, Dream deals with a similar problem all the time. Because many people don't like him, and also because many people do like him, absolutely every little thing he says is put under the microscope. Such as him sharing his experiences with ADHD and medication for it was misinterpreted in a way that people thought he was endorsing throwing away your medication. <laughs> Naturally, he was upset and tweeted about how his music was no better than casual hip-hop artists talking about music emoji, drugs, drugs, music emoji. <laughs> and that was taken as him being racist? Yep, that's right. Dream saying that hip hop talks about drugs is now classed as racism. Dream has given way too much flack for the smallest stuff, and he definitely doesn't help that with the fact that he frequently caves in. You apologize for the smallest things to the point that it makes you look bad. There is now unironically a movement praising the concept of getting Dream deplatformed and actively creating a crowd of Dream antis to band together and hate Dream. This right here is the same kind of community as the insufferable Dream stands. You're no better than any of them. One of the main reasons people people complain about Dream Stands is because of their involvement in deplatforming and cancel culture. And then people critical of Dream do this. People will say outrageous stuff about Dream and then scream, here come the stands, when people say that it was a stupid thing of them to do. And keep note that I am not perfect and have fallen victim to this idea too, and I have given some smelly points against Dream myself. Points that I would not have made if it were anybody else, nor if I wasn't personally involved. As said, if this exact idea of deplatforming or that he is somehow responsible for what his audience does was done with anybody else, even anybody else as bad as him, it would be seen as extremely dumb. But it's acceptable because it's Dream, and Dream is the big bad. There are many things to criticise Dream and his fanbase for. Heck, I made a full video documenting these criticisms, which included a segment that more accurately explains my thoughts on his fanbase. But acting like he does not deserve a platform because of his fanbase is pretty petty and pretty babyish. What I'm trying to emphasise here is that in many incidents of internet conflict, people would never have even cared if it hadn't been a particular individual, against a particular individual, or at a particular point in time. Just as if it wasn't Dream or Anision, people would laugh at a lot of the points made about them. But there would also not be a hundred subreddits writing dissertations about every move they make. <laughs> and just like how the ever so lovely h 3 h subreddit was in blind support of Trisha and her fiancé Moses. But as soon as she left the show, they suddenly began to uncover supposed evidence of Trisha abusing Moses. Why did you not care about this before? Well, because she was on the show and you couldn't be bothered to consider her a bad person. That's right. Also, when Shane Dawson returned to YouTube after his cancellation and hiatus, people were very critical of how his documentary was quite problematic. However, Shane Dawson documentaries had always been rather daft, but people only began to acknowledge it because, well, they didn't like him anymore. As said, people only care if it's a specific person that does the bad. I could go on for days with hypothetical examples of this. The same people that upload half a dozen videos a day on, uh, let's say, how much they dislike iNabba might then call him obsessive for making more than one video on James Charles. <laughs> people ignore the nuance of their points simply because it benefits how they would look in the public opinion simply because people supposedly want the ambiguous YouTuber to apologise for their mistakes. In this case, for some reason I never, I'm really sorry Fraser, they wind up talking about minute issues to continue adding to the look how bad this person is pile, to get a nice whiff of the pleasures of everyone thinking they're a good person for also calling out somebody bad. I think we need to have a bit of a conversation when it comes to dogpiling the same creator over and over again. You say it's in the name of holding them accountable, but if they haven't changed their ways by video 14, what will make video 27 do it. 
Nobody deserves to live their life under a microscope. Accountability is becoming somewhat redundant here in the YouTube space because oftentimes people will say they care about getting the person to apologize, but they really don't. <laughs> They'll claim that they're tired of talking about an issue and then will proceed to make more videos on the most simple things. Seriously, how do you lot keep this up? They'll only talk about somebody because it's that specific person. They'll keep them under the microscope, as Willie said quite eloquently there. This can lead to one of three outcomes. The creator could be almost completely in the right and still have the entire community lambast them for it. False narratives could be spread about the creator gradually as the audience begins to hate them more and more, needing an excuse to continue hating on them. Or the creator might make an actual wholehearted apology for their deeds and the general public would still not forgive them because they don't want to. These key elements will become very prominent throughout this video, so keep them somewhere safe. At this rate, saying somebody must be held accountable is somewhat of a use of hyperbole or deflection as people often do not care what the creator says or does following the controversy. They simply want dirt on the person because it's entertaining to excrete on them. It's somewhat of a cop-out to make their intentions look good when in reality they're just making bank. People might bring up inane and redundant criticism because it's profitable, otherwise it might be just to look good and cool. If you want to look like a hero in saving the community and you're bringing up redundant criticism as in doing so, then you probably don't smell very nice and need to get a bit of fresh air. <laughs> Let's have a look at an example involving many creators that I enjoy watching, because it's always fun when I do that. In 2019, the reaction commentary YouTuber by the name of Just Destiny had a rather humorous critique made on him by the young creator known as, you guessed it, LT Cobra. Believe me, this is relevant to the topic, just give me a moment. Throughout the video, the lieutenant mocked Mr. Destiny for his rather explicit thumbnails, which were meant to be depictions of children. The only reason that the situation escalated anywhere near the point it did was just because of just attempting to remove the video from YouTube through a DMCA takedown, despite later filing a cease and desist to Cobra's email, which by the way is not how you file cease and desists. At which point the entire commentary community began to band up against Just Destiny because they felt it was the morally righteous thing to do to get him to own up to his mistakes and learn his lesson. Just Destiny you probably know from the last two weeks or so of drama. Just Destiny. 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 Members of the now defunct NCO thought that he was a major threat to the commentary community as a whole because he abused the copyright system. Hey, sounds like several other situations we know. Though it may have started as a naughty reaction commentator abusing the copyright system story, people slowly began to justify shunning him out of the community with other criticisms, namely in regards to his thumbnails, as with the original critique. You can disagree with the thumbnails of course, even JD does now. However, they were disregarding that people within the same community also have dodgy thumbnails for clickbait. <laughs> even one of my favourite YouTubers. Sure, it's a bit weird and questionable to exploit a 14 year old for views, but in the grand scheme of things, so many people on here do it, it's almost a moot point. Yet a number of people got into a call as a plan to take down Just Destiny because they thought the thumbnails implied that he was some sort of deviant. They even went out of their way to see if they could prove that he was a registered one because of the clickbait thumbnails, which isn't a very nice thing to do in my opinion. Keemstar worked with a known doxer to do so by the way. Lovely. At this stage, it was no longer simply about holding him accountable for what he had actually done, it was more about charging at him full force with other completely random, barely grounded points, because people thought for some reason that would be the best way to handle conflict over a false copyright strike. The only reason the points about the thumbnails were brought up was because Just Destiny was seen as a bad person anyway. Similarly, with a few other strange criticisms like how bad they thought his content was, etc. It went from a point of trying to hold the person accountable for doing something wrong, in this case abusing the copyright system, System, straight to digging up as much possible information about them that could negatively contribute to their image, including going out of their way to dox them on a call with a lawyer. Nice. The narrative slowly shifted because the idea of holding them accountable got misplaced somewhere, to the extent of trying to prove that Just Destiny was a racist for saying the n-word. Yes, that's right, Keemstar tried to prove somebody was a racist because they said the n-word. This is very similar in the case of James Charles, a YouTuber whom everybody loves at this rate. Jimmy has admitted on video, now deleted, to interacting with people he supposedly never realised were under the age of 18. This is something that I would have a three hour conversation 
scolding him for like a disappointed mother, don't get me wrong. But that's not to say that people didn't forget about the taking accountability narrative. Those of you that know about Deaf Noodles will probably know about the many controversies surrounding false accusations against James Charles. For a long while after James was subsequently accused of these things and genuinely owned up to some of them, there were a number of false accusations from clout chasers that came shortly following this, and they were inherently dumb. One of which was an accusation uploaded on TikTok by an individual that conveniently typed the term hashtag meme in the description of the video. Still, many people, including Deaf Noodles himself, reported on it as though it was a fact without fact checking. For the record, Deaf Noodles has apologised, however this is not what I would consider holding James accountable. Spreading blatant lies without verification isn't holding people accountable, it's essentially, well, the closest thing to slander without it being a legal term. James's actions are irrefutable and undeniably bad. There is no arguing against how stupid his actions were, especially after 2019, he should have known better. However, However, false accusations are still false accusations. Just with Onion Man and Gabby Hanna, these are blatantly false accusations against James. No matter what you say, it's still a false narrative and it's still bad. These are not helping hold people accountable, but are rather damaging the case. So, people will begin to take hypocritical and sometimes inhumane action against people they see as bad in the light of holding them accountable. This is proven time and time again. But what if those content creators who do so are told to take accountability themselves? Well, they aren't always the best at it, I'll be honest. I know a good number of commentary and tea creators that when called out for a mistake of some kind, will do very little to make up for it or apologise. However, in that same string of code, I know many that do. In my previous video, I spent a reasonable amount of time discussing a lapse in judgement, if you will, by my friend Nicholas Diorio. I was pleased and somewhat very flattered to note that shortly after the video's release, Nick posted a statement thanking me for the criticism. His response to my video is something that I don't only encourage others to learn from, but wish to do myself. As somebody of Nick's stature that's constantly dishing out criticism, it's very good to see him take responsibility for his actions, as much as Death Noodles will say that he doesn't do that. <laughs> Similarly, on December 14th, 2020, a video was released by John Swan on his second channel about the YouTube and TikTok drama channel known as Rhea Official. He called her out for one of her interesting videos covering Charlie D'Amelio's allegedly leaked photos. They were all fake by the way. But if you have photoshopped images of a person under the age of 18 like that, you're still breaking the law. Anyway, Agronol Pal Rhea here apologised on her community tab not long after John released that video. Very good to see. On the contrary, one of the people that is not particularly great at taking accountability is a YouTuber known as No you know what, I'll just refer to him by his real name. Brooks Heatherly is an alt-right content creator whom I think is very funny for all the wrong reasons. His politics have little to no reason why I think he's a funny individual by the way, but rather the fact that his takes are just funny in general. <laughs> he's just a funny old chap that happens to be alt-right. In a debate between Jay Xe, Tommy C and Nicholas Diorio vs Brooks show, they brought up multiple clips that Jay was going to be using from Mr Heatherly in her upcoming video on him, to which people on the livestream found understandably amusing. Instead of owning up to the fact that these statements may have aged poorly or were rather daft in general, Brooks switched his argument to say that at least he's being entertaining. Thank Wait, you for watching. You don't you find it I really appreciate long. you guys enjoying my content. Which was obviously not the original intention of those videos. Just to be clear, the point that he is currently making isn't something that he was asked about. It's a deflection to distract from the failure of his previous deflection, which he only made to distract from the failure of the deflection he made before that. We're three layers away from the original point now, friends. Brooks had been a little bit silly in some of his videos. People laughed at him for it, and he didn't own up to the fact that he had been a little bit silly in his videos, and that was the end of that. But not for long, because in a different situation, Heatherly also responded to people spreading John Swan's docs around and acted all confused as if he had no idea that they were spreading his docs around in the same thread. When John reached out asking him to stop, Brooks said, But do you really think you could be asking people for favours after lying about them? He also said, You didn't get cares who do settle down. Which is a lovely thing to say in my opinion. In a case where somebody he was arguing with had somebody objectively bad happen to them, he decided to ignore their request and not interact because, well, they were arguing arguing with him so they don't deserve support. He didn't account for how him interacting with a doxo is not a great idea, despite him making hundreds of critical videos on other people. Awesome. Whether Big Boy Brooks was malicious or not is out of the question. At the end of the day, he didn't own up to the fact that he made some silly statements and that he had done something a tad morally wrong. <coughs> he kept shifting his motive to look cool in a way that he wouldn't have to admit to being wrong. I'm asking you for the bare minimum not to interact with my doxer on Twitter. Well, they seem to be making good points about you. Meanwhile, <laughs> you're making terrible memes about me. <laughs> they know where you live. That's a pretty good point. What an interesting debacle. That truly is the end of that. 
But not for long, Ethan Klein from H383 and Keemstar have had a feud for so long now that Boblax can casually post a 5 hour, 43 minute and 48 second long video discussing it. Both of these individuals have reached a point where they are literally the same person, and neither can seem to own up to their mistakes despite calling out others on it. Case 1. Keemstar says that Ethan Klein is bad for targeting his sponsors, while simultaneously having done that himself at one point, which he was a tiny bit hesitant in owning up to. Case 2. Ethan blames Keem for supporting a known doxer that we discussed earlier in this video, while ignoring Colossal is crazy and multiple others warning him of a certain individual that he endorsed himself. I could go on for ages, however the point is that people attempting to force others to take accountability don't even seem to know how to do it themselves. It somewhat intertwines with my first point too, in this case it's an it's okay when I do it situation. A another creator that seems to have struggled to admit to their own mistakes, despite calling out others for it, is Prince Kai the Not Very Wise. Now I understand that there there are a couple of pretty hefty abuse allegations now levied against him by his previous partner Omnia, but because I'm slow at making videos and I want this to be more jolly, this segment will be about his copyright meltdowns. So essentially, long story short, our friendly neighbourhood alleged abuser kinda copyright striked another content creator because over 40% of Vakumu's video was his content, in their response video to him. Many people began to confront him on how that was a pretty cringe move. Regardless, it was later discovered by, oh for goodness sake John you're involved and everything, that Kai had used somebody's full video within his own. On a separate occasion, used a full unedited four minutes of footage in his Hopeless Features documentary, and had criticised other people for not including the full context, i.e. his full video, in the past. Professional liar and Dream SMP member John Swan confronted him in a debate about this, and he ended up rage quitting because Kai isn't a very easy person to reason with, I'll be honest with you. You were incredibly intellectually dishonest. This is the most unproductive, stupid conversation I have ever had in my life. I can't wait until that counter notification gets approved and Akumi's video comes back up. I invite you to sue him, but you won't do that, because you know you'll lose. If you fancy wasting an afternoon and subsequently half of your brain cells, I would highly recommend listening to the debate between Prince Kai and John Swan yourself. Kai quite objectively lost the debate. If not for his rather funny performance, it would be for the tantrums on Twitter following the incident. After what he called winning the debate, he turned off his YouTube comments, then blocked a number of people on Twitter, then deleted his Twitter, and finally deleted his YouTube channel. Yep, now that's what I call an epic dub for Kai. One could somehow argue that Kai had won the stream debate, but he automatically lost by deleting everything and subsequently making all of these incredibly weird posts following the debate. If you react this poorly to the community's opinion being that you lost the debate about copyright, you've automatically lost the who came out looking better side of the debate. He claimed that because people were saying he lost the debate, he was being harassed by the community. The thing is that Kai is a commentary YouTuber, he made dozens of of extensive videos about hopeless peaches. Yet as soon as he lost a debate against the guy that has like a third of the community disliking him, it became a problem with the commentary genre. Talking about how he was harassed because he had lost the debate, and yes, I'm sure that somebody with a far greater moral code than I could totally make this argument. However, Kai and I are on an even playing field here. He is a commentary creator, yet he can't accept a loss and shouts harassment even though he inflicts the exact same effects on other creators who arguably have done stuff nowhere near as bad as him. He is literally making money off of supposedly holding people accountable. Yet as soon as he loses the debate, he can't handle the accountability himself. He even went as far to literally blame his ex-partner Omnia for the copyright strike when he was being levied with abuse allegations against him, still avoiding responsibility even when the consequences are much larger real-world consequences. In the words of Igneous from Songs of War, what a nice person. Oh, well, you know, we have to feel, you know, holy majesty's taking accountability! Accountability? Perhaps you could even use Just Destiny as an example of this criticism. I mean, he copyright striked a piece of criticism on him, in spite of the fact that he was a commentary channel himself and consistently made videos talking about other people's misdeeds. Heck, he himself didn't like copyright abusers. Another individual is our lovely last creep show art. Why does it have to be another person that I used to be on good terms with? She was publicly outed as an interesting individual for posting content on LOLCOW, which is basically the makeup gossip equivalent of 4chan, which are both almost as bad as Kiwi Farms, or popular be nasty about other people social media sites. The interesting thing is that she was posting some content on her account, and was simultaneously posting a lot of other weird and downright horrible content anonymously, backstabbing her friends, doxing her own sister, and posting evidence against herself for some weird reason. It's 
practically a 99.9% chance that she did it, which is very sad. However, in response to the situation, she did not immediately own up to it as the T-channel with the likes of herself would expect others to do. No. Instead, she went out and claimed that an individual by the false name of Amy had been stalking her and posting defamatory content about her on a spoofed IP. It was later brought out by the owners of the LogCal forums that the browser cookies of Creepshow's posts and the anonymous posts were the same as one another. Also, in private messages, Shannon told people not to defend her and said that she would be dealing with things legally. Only time will tell what becomes of that story. Regardless, if she is in the wrong, which is looking pretty likely, I mean she lost a tad over 160,000 subscribers for goodness sake, it is rather interesting to see that she made dozens and dozens of videos holding other people accountable, yet not doing it herself. Which is rather sad to see actually, I'm not gonna lie. Tati is another one of these individuals, who only recently properly returned to YouTube because a number of people dislike her quite a bit. With the recent accusations against James Charles, more people are beginning to pity her. But I'm not gonna hide the fact that she's not been particularly good at covering up her intentions or, you guessed it, taking accountability. First, it was James had definitely harmed her despite her being so darn good to him in the past. Then, once James responded, there was no longer an issue. He forgave her. Probably. That's what it looks like. Then, a year later, Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson began to receive a lot of flack. They were seen as these big and evil monsters of the makeup industry. So, Tati comes out and claims that it was them that caused her to make the video. They manipulated her into it. Which may have been somewhat likely, though her problems with James and her initial Buy Sister video were clearly over-promoting a rival brand from hers, but alas. You are so manipulative! A lot of the narrative surrounding Tati has changed out of recent due to the allegations against James. But let's not forget that she made the accusation, backtrack when was no longer popular, shifted the blame when it was popular to hate bomb Shane Dawson and Jeffree Star. The moment that Jeffree went off on you, I should have run for the hills. And then happily returned when the new allegations, which she wouldn't have known about within the time of By Sister by the way, overcame James. I don't know, just seems very suspicious to me. Especially considering it was almost completely established that the majority of the claims that Tati made were completely false. She was just right about him being a deviant. He promoted these pills as a thank you to this brand that helped him. Without thinking too much about it, he ignored the fact that Tati might get upset. Tati got really upset and instead of calling or talking to James or picking up his calls, she decides she's gonna do this video no matter what because she's had enough. Since there is not yet any direct evidence that James knew the ages, and for now it appears that he had been catfished multiple times, it is also unwise to immediately say, Tati was right, because she was not. Her intentions were not to hold James accountable, it was very clearly about the vitamins. And the fact that people have now changed their mind completely on that in spite of making full series on the subject is quite funny to me. Unfortunately, the chances of James actually being a deviant are rather high because only a moron would be catfished as many times as he was, being about five by the way. However, innocent until proven guilty is very important in these sorts of situations, because you can't imagine the mental and emotional stress it would put on someone being falsely accused of something that they didn't do. James is quite likely to be a deviant because the number of accusers is climbing concerningly high, but that doesn't immediately mean that Tati's intentions were good. Similarly with Jeffree Star, he's still somewhat of a mafia boss. I'm sure Tati wants to move on from the situation, I'm sure James does too, so I'm just gonna slip it off to the side here. Tati looks like she may have developed good intentions, but only time will tell on that front. Now sure, opening up to your own mistakes and holding yourself accountable can be extremely difficult, especially after the situation has blown past what is seemingly the point of no return. And boy, I should know that considering I know multiple people that have crossed that line. However, I can say from not quite experience, the best thing you can possibly do in a situation for everybody involved, including yourself, is hold yourself accountable when others do the same. It's especially helpful if your career is literally revolved around holding others accountable. If you make a mistake and people call you out on it, just look into it and see if it's a genuine mistake that you've made. If you don't do so or stay convinced that you're in the right, unfortunately you're going to have to expect yourself to get backlash for it. You'll be the only person to hold accountable for the backlash you receive if it's a case where you happen to be in the wrong. Don't hold yourself accountable for saying things like music emoji, drugs music emoji, when people claim that you're being racist through it though. Think for yourself and if it's a genuine mistake, own up. Up to it. It's not always easy to admit when you're wrong, and it's even worse when you surround yourself with an echo chamber. It's even worse when you surround yourself with an echo chamber. It's even worse when you surround yourself. But if your friends are calling you out, you probably have made a big mistake, and it's worth looking into even if you genuinely think that you didn't. If you did, however, just own up to it. You'll probably save yourself a few of the 160,000 subscribers. If one thing has been proven with those previously addressed situations, it's that a lot of people do like to tell others off for not taking accountability 
but when it's their turn, aren't particularly great at it. At this point, the use of the term take accountability is more of a quick relief to tell the YouTuber that they're simply a small grasp away from being redeemed, yet the individual often, not always, ignores the apology because essentially it's not fun to accept an apology, or otherwise is just not willing to note that they've made an apology at all. This is apparent in situations with the likes of Blue Stank owning up to his mistakes during the ever so famous Slazo conflict in 2019. To this day, I see people complain about how he was a terrible person for being involved, and while supporting a false accusation against somebody you were supposedly friends with is obviously immoral and there's no challenging it, Blue's Dank has apologised on multiple occasions, and has participated in interviews in which he is very remorseful over the situation. Regardless of his apologies, people still go on rampages telling him and others to take accountability. To that I counteract in saying that Blue's Dank is probably one of the few people who have properly taken accountability, but it's still ignored because people can't be bothered to look at the full story. This is once again shown in how the community responded to Logan Paul following the Suicide Forest incident. You see, his initial apology was very poor and I love mocking it. I don't think there has been a video in the past two years why I haven't at least included a clip of it at some point. However, it's quite interesting to me that he spent ages making documentaries, videos and donations to suicide prevention charities in response to the whole thing. Yet people will still speculate his intentions and argue that he is still a bad person for that whole conflict. Myself included, unfortunately. It happened several years ago now and he made numerous attempts to redeem himself for it. But people ignore them because, well, it's funny to laugh at Logan Paul's suicide forest incident. Logan Paul, come and film this, I think I just killed a man. Similarly with Sky Williams, somebody that was almost completely innocent for all that he was accused of and was shunned off the internet with very little reason. It took my mate Technicals making a video covering the situation over a year later to actually change the narrative surrounding Sky. If Sky had initially made a response, however, people would probably not have even cared. It's the big and evil Sky Williams that is definitively in the wrong because my favourite YouTuber said so. If you look at the responses to Technicals video, it's astonishing the sheer number of people that will claim to have read the lengthy document but will not watch a 51 minute video. This makes me wonder if Slazo's response video had received bad press initially, how different would the narrative surrounding him be? It would probably be very similar to the case of Zaptai, somebody who was practically framed by the public because very few people considered his story true until it was reassessed in 2019. In addition to Sky Williams' issue, it coincides with my previous point, that now Jisoo has been called out for spreading false narratives, she won't take accountability herself and is doing everything in her power to move on. Anyway, very few people are willing to listen to somebody's apology or response because they don't like them. They aren't holding the person accountable a lot of the time. They want to dig up dirt because getting grubby is more fun than showering it off. People will say that somebody did not apologise or did not post a sincere enough apology, and will sometimes not even have actually read what the individual posted. Look, I'm Alex is very controversial, Pokimane is very controversial, but when they apologise people immediately found reasons to hate their apologies for being too, too formulaic or too late. But at least they did. This is where, now that we've trundled through hundreds of basic examples of this facade, we reach practically the major and most blatant example that seems to fit all of the points that I'm making within this video into one neat little package. How lovely. Well, for this section there is a painfully large amount of context to explain so that the average tea channel doesn't come at my throat, so bear with me here. I'm sorry for crying through this, it's just like, it's hard to talk about because I'm talking about a teen who was taken. She would just like take a situation and be like, no, this is none of this is my this fault. This is the most unjustified, unfair hate train I've ever seen on YouTube. Do you really put the blame on Gabby and call her a horrible person? Oh, it just blows my mind how unaware she is. Back in January 2020, self-proclaimed washed-up has-been Gabby Hanna uploaded a light-hearted video in which she tries to become an e-girl. As with the video's creation, it was becoming somewhat of a trend to become an e-girl or e-boy. As with the rise of TikTok and the popularity of that song. It was an average Gabby Hanna video, supposedly about as inoffensive as the average Harry Potter book, and about as exciting as the average Bob Clark film, until a certain moment at which she looks at a picture of an individual that, for the purposes of not making a murder victim a point of argument in this video, will have their name changed to Chloe Davis. It's quite obvious which individual this is, but out of respect for the person's mother, who clearly just wants to move on, I will not be naming them. Gabby was looking at an article about the rise of popularity of e-girls on the internet. She was doing so to skim read the description of an e-girl and look at several pictures of them so that she could dress up as one. But here is where the unnecessarily convoluted drama comes in. She stumbled across a picture of Chloe Davis, clearly not reading the caption next to it that references her unfortunate murder. That's my perspective at least, as if you watch the footage closely, you can see that she immediately looks at the picture and proceeds to comment on it. There is not enough time between her scrolling down and commenting on the picture to have read the caption. Likewise, on a rather 
naive move, I doubt that anybody else noticed the caption during the production of the video due to the subjects of attention being on the picture and not the caption. However, if you are of the opinion that she read the caption, what she did was still not that bad. Let me explain. And I'm not making fun of them because I get it and I want it. I want to be it. Yeah. I'm too old. If I was <laughs> this age, this would be me. 100% so. For sure. This outfit right here is you already straight wear. up what I wore from seventh grade to college. And now. And now. <laughs> I do have that shirt. Why don't you do clothes right now? I want to do that last. As you can see within this clip, Gabby complimented the shirt and the style of the individual that also happens to be the victim of something tragic. The untimely death of Chloe is obviously horrible, but Gabby meant literally no harm from what she said. I do have that shirt. In the same vein, Gabby complimented Commenting Chloe's style is not a way of disrespecting the murder victim. It may be slightly insensitive at the absolute worst, but it's completely harmless at best. In fact, the way I see it is that it's more wholesome for Chloe to be remembered for being pretty and having a cool sense of style as opposed to what she's actually known for. But hey, maybe that's just me. Regardless, several T channels, including a few that I'm on good terms with, made videos on the subject. Simply because Gabby Hanna is a hated individual and it's profitable. Gabby doesn't even care or acknowledge that the poor girl was murdered. Gabby, this outfit right here. Believe you me, if anybody else with more of a squeaky clean reputation did this, there would be far less of an uproar. Hence arrives one of the main points of this video. Gabby Hanna is heavily disliked. Many of the things people dislike her for are definitely valid. And boy, will the hundreds of thousands of videos with millions of views tell you that much. But additionally, there are still many things that are pretty pathetic that people will still lambast her for regardless of whether she's actually in the right or not. Including this tweet that accumulated thousands of likes saying that Gabby did not care about Chloe because she has not tweeted the petition or linked to the foundation. Whereas Comment Cop will happily point out, it's just not the case, is it? On the note of bringing up main points of this video, another one is the fact that people who ask for accountability will not always provide it when they are required to give it. For example, our lovely last Megan Ranks here has still not apologised for this pretty blatant mistake. I would not think that her blatant lie was made in bad faith, it could just be a mistake of her not properly reading, but if I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt on that, I think it would only be fair if she reciprocates in saying that Gabby probably didn't just read that part of the article. <laughs> because clearly you would know all too well about what accidentally not reading something would be like. Again, I don't think that Megan is a bad person. I actually know very little about her. She could be lovely, but this is rather daft in my eyes. Coming back to the Chloe story, as said, many T channels made videos on the topic, many of which did not necessarily do much looking into the situation overall. But how does she not see that she's reading an article from a, a, a tragedy? The whole article next to it was about that girl and she was by someone she met on this not just a picture it was a literal article that talked about the tragic murder that she was involved in how would you feel as someone's mother that was murdered and you came across some youtuber that was just randomly looking at an article about their daughter being murdered this would be a perfectly valid point if true and this segment would be looking very different but this is simply not the case. The article was not about Chloe Davis. It was never about Chloe Davis. Let's have a look at the article itself, shall we? The title of the article is already a bit of a red flag. It clearly makes absolutely no reference to the case. The title is merely E-Girls and E-Boys Explain. Very ambiguous. The subtitle for the article also makes no reference to the story. After sifting through a boomer's enticing attempt at explaining E-Girls, we reach the section about Chloe. Said section is 88 words long. Bear that in mind. The entire article is 2,464 words long, rounding that number down to exclude random nonsense and dividing 88 by the number of words of the entire article, it comes out as a whopping 4.05% of the article actually being about Chloe. Yet multiple T-channels still said that the entire article was about her. Worse yet, many of the T-channels were saying that Gabby exploited Chloe's murder for views. Well, as I think you'll find that approximately 8.01 seconds of Gabby's video even includes Chloe in it. This is out of a total runtime of 19 minutes and 34 seconds. Or alternatively, 1174.27 seconds. This makes Chloe's segment about 0.69% of the total runtime of the video. That is what I call exploitative. In fact, if you ask me, which I can guarantee you nobody did, the T-channels that were talking about this whole situation, putting Chloe's name in the title and thumbnail, were perhaps exploiting her murder far more than Gabby was. Where does the topic of the video tie in? Well, let's just say that for a long while, not one single T-channel had backtracked on this point, other than the fantastic YouTuber that goes by the name of Ready to Glare, who had done very little other than simply report on the story. She never even made this claim and still apologized. Repsilla has now noted their discretion. This was a lack of research on my part. 
I got caught up in the narratives of other videos, then perpetuated how those videos influenced me. And apologized on their community tab. Good for them for taking accountability for their actions. Now sure, it did take a full debate with Nick and Bo Blax to actually get him to apologize, which we'll look at in a minute, but at least he apologized at all, you know? Unfortunately though, because their videos were such good examples, I'll still be referring to them in this video. But keep in mind, Repzilla has owned up to their mistakes. Good on you, mate. Also, for clarity's sake, Angelica Oles told me privately that she was simply reporting on the story as people are angry at Gabby for this reason. And it was just a little bit insensitive. And I just kind of talked about it and just said, I wish she had addressed it. Take that how you will. She has not owned up to the mistake elsewhere. The final point this drama accurately demonstrates on a silver platter is that from this particular situation, many were telling her to apologize publicly while simultaneously saying that she should not be bringing much attention to the issue. A theme that will remain very clear as time goes on. It appears to make little to no sense because Gabby has no way of winning here. Would she sit back and simply allow this completely false narrative around her to spread like wildfire and continue to eat her career? Personally, I wouldn't like that. I don't know about you. So the natural reaction would be to respond. In fact, specifically in this circumstance, she did respond with an apology. It was a fairly minor issue and I feel her apology was very well thought out. The family of Chloe accepted her apology and even scrutinized the drama channels for blowing up the situation to the extent that they did. You'd think that would be a job well done, wouldn't you? Well, not exactly. <laughs> People somewhat completely ignored her apology for what I would consider to be an honest mistake, and she was attacked from all angles for it, and had hundreds of people telling her to apologize, still to the day of her bringing the situation up again, even though the family had accepted her apology. In spite of her apology, where she quite directly assesses the misinformation about the article being all about Chloe, many people that originally made the claim still did not correct themselves over this point, not really taking accountability. In a follow-up video, Repzilla still claimed that the article was about Chloe. And not just a picture, it was a literal article. All it looks like to me is like, the E stands for electronic, talking about TikTok, like it's such a lighthearted article. Which in my opinion was very dodgy. As explained throughout this segment before, they have apologized since, but it's a point worth noting as Repzilla wasn't the only one. They also claim that reaching out to Chloe's mother may have been manipulative. Basically this stranger hops in the DMs and says, hey, I am I'm extremely sorry, I did this thing, it was unintentional, I didn't mean to. Well, of course, Ms. Nevada County Mother's gonna be like, oh, well, that's okay. I can't stress this enough, this isn't only Repzilla. Even though Gabby apologized, reached out to the mother of Chloe, and removed the video, she's still in the wrong, because she apologized. <laughs> this right here is the issue I'm trying to assess. Just like with Sky Williams or Blues Dank, an apology is simply not enough, apparently. It feels somewhat as though they are angry with somebody for something, but because they're angry, they don't accept when the person actually takes accountability for what they wanted them to. Just letting you know, Angelica's video talking about Gabby's apology was pretty decent for the most part, and I agreed with it. But, I mean, after uploading, she almost immediately retracted her statement after looking at the video's tags. Lovely. In today's video, I defended Gabby Hanna because of her apology, and while looking at the thumbnail, I came across the tag she put on that apology. I regret being nice now. I can't do a woman's voice. I'm so sorry, Technicals. I failed you. What can I say? There are 24 videos and 123,000 tweets that have followed the video, and she, to this very day, believes that Gabby did read the point of the article. Interesting move there. Obviously, I wasn't around in this particular point in time, but there was a lot of negative stigma around Gabby, so Angelica probably just thought for some reason Gabby needed to be held accountable for using drama channels in her tags. And I'm being attacked for using tags about the people who are talking about this situation. This will turn into something else. And all the drama channels will talk about it. And now his name is going to get plastered into thumbnails and titles. And people are going to talk about her more and exploit this situation that I tried to put an end to. I addressed this one because it was important because people were using his name and story and reducing her to nothing but a victim when she had a life that she lived and she didn't deserve that. My assumption is that the audience was strongly opposing Gabby, so Angelica was easily pushed into believing them, which is something she told me she does frequently when we are speaking in private. But you know what? The original video about Gabby's apology was good. I avowed the original video, just ignore what follows. The only trouble is that I can't say that her opinion on Gabby is very positive at the moment. Now, all right, I'm probably being a bit harsh on our Las Angela here. Just take this as more of a case study, if you will. I don't think that she's necessarily necessarily a bad person. It's actually sad that I have to clarify that. Nor do I think that what she's done here is irredeemable. However, likewise, I think it's a shame that she dishes out criticism almost on a daily basis and is willing to fight fire with fire. She essentially holds people accountable to an extortionate amount. But when it comes to accepting an L, if you will, she struggles to do it herself. There have, of course, been numerous occasions where I have given her criticism and she accepted it quite openly. But when it comes to a person she doesn't like, such as Perez Hilton, James Charles, or Gabby Hanna, she refuses to take responsibility for a 
a mistake herself. It's really sad that through the increasing number of times I've addressed the tea community in my videos, there is little to no improvement made. If anything, it's getting worse. Tea channels with the likes of Angelica, Repsilla, Petty Page and Creepshow Art will claim to have great intentions of trying to fight racism, homophobia and any other thing you could possibly fight. Whereas in reality, they're only trying to get the bag and barely even have the opinions they portray in their videos. I hate to throw Angelica under the bus yet again, but she has told me that she often finds that she focuses more on following the popular opinion and reporting on it as opposed to actually giving her own opinion, claiming that as a channel her size it's dangerous to do anything else. Is that healthy though? I mean everybody thought that Slazo is in the wrong, so it's easily manipulated. Angelica will argue that the audience is very strict with any action she makes, but then is part of the strict group of people to larger creators. She will lambast Gabby Hanna making several videos talking about how Gabby hasn't really said anything, but then when she gets a piece of constructive criticism from Willie Mac show, it's an immediate block. Or me? Well, she doesn't bother to read it. Of course, there are people that I associate with that simultaneously lack the capability to hear Angelica out. Why is he adamant on defending her? She's a fucking degenerate. He's I don't know changed. why Corbett does this. The amount of times he's tried to cover clip? for her, it just doesn't work. Stop fucking defending morons who don't accept your fucking criticism. Uh, guys, do you think they actually read the tweet that's on the screen where I'm doing the opposite from defending her? Short digs at my own mates aside, Angelica gets upset when people don't hear her out. Yet she barely even acknowledges what Gabby says because it's a lie or exaggeration or a deluded idea she has of the situation. Again, I'm hyper-focusing on Angelica here, and I don't mean to do so with malice, but she is possibly the most clear-cut example of what is happening. She definitely is not the only one, by the way. Similarly, Repzilla made a video calling out Gabby Hanna for the Chloe stuff, because, in a paraphrase of his own words, she was a popular subject of controversy at the time. His video was objectively wrong on a couple of standings, but it took a full 1 hour and 14 minute debate between him and Nicholas Diorio, plus a conversation with Boblax, for him to finally own up to the fact that he was wrong in said video. People will constantly dish out criticism. In the case of Repzilla, for example, he will call out people for not watching his full Keemstar video where he calls a 20 year old a child, yet will also not read an article that he claims is a murder article himself. Nice. Just to be clear by the way, I have been critical of Bill and BWC and Repsilla. They all make pretty good content and BWC's video about Gabby Hanna sets a fantastic ground for my opinion on her. So I don't mean any harm. It's just a tad funny to me, isn't it? It also offers more insight into why Gabby distrusts her critics and raises concerns of how those who claim to hold others accountable hold themselves accountable. But back to Miss Alez, she has one of the largest tea channels on the platform, so people respect her opinion. Even I do to a very minor degree. <laughs> Yet when it comes to making a mistake, her choice is to say that it's just your opinion, or just argue that you're downright wrong. Angelica has countless things to criticise other people for that she is correct in doing. But if you can't take responsibility yourself when it's due, it taints your reputation as a cheat channel quite a bit there, mate. Gabby, nor Angelica, seem to be able to take responsibility for their own wrongdoings, no matter how many people seem to tell them to. Well, what can I say? With their constant arguing and millions of eyes on the situation, it's only going to send you down the rabbit hole further. People are at a point where they're ratioing Chloe's mother because she doesn't like the narrative that they're trying to tell. It's not like that Chloe's mother has specifically said to Gabby that she wants Angelica to apologise to Gabby or anything. Now that I've spent the better half of somebody's 8 hour work shift explaining the controversy, allow me to summarise. Gabby Hanna made a light hearted video that happened to include somebody that in some people's eyes shouldn't have been there. So T channels naturally rallied up against her, forcing her to take accountability, because they didn't like her beforehand. In doing so, they spread a decent amount of misinformation, in which they didn't take accountability for. And when Gabby actually took accountability, many of them said that she was still a bad person and that she was being manipulative. What a thrilling tale. I truly hope that you're still awake after all of that mess. Oi, wake up! By no means do I mean to get philosophical here, but on the internet people rarely seem to be consistent when it comes to taking accountability. The internet appears to have this misconception that either somebody is completely in the right and has never and will never do anything wrong, or they are by far the worst person in history akin to a colonial dictator. Either Pyrocynical was slandered by Turkey Tom, or he's a downright irrefutable groomer. There seems to be very little nuance in most cases. T channels seem to imply that audiences should either believe Gabby Hanna is as bad as Anision, or is perfectly innocent. People 
unlike myself, Black Wolf Company, Nicholas Durio, Bo Blacks, and multiple others, will be perfectly capable of saying that Gabby Hanna has made multiple mistakes in the past. But that doesn't mean she can't be right on some specific issues. Nobody's right all of the time, and nobody's wrong all of the time, as much as I'm sure you wish it was that way. Unfortunately, often it only depends on the person when it comes to how willing we are to accept their apology for a minor mistake. We can forgive Pew Pew Pie for the Wall Street Journal stuff in 2016, many will even defend him, but apparently we can't forgive Jay Schlapp for making multiple edgy jokes now. This is the case because PewDiePie was a very non-controversial figure, and many people really like him. Whereas some of those people heavily dislike Jay Schlapp, so he's automatically always bad. People change the goalposts for different situations based on who they like and more, as already addressed with Dream and John Swan. If you're going to make a point against somebody that you wouldn't have made if it wasn't that person, why make it at all? Obviously you can make videos on people and put rep squad best squad in the pinned comment all you want, but at the end of the day you've got to be consistent in how you treat other persons. Because if there's anybody disrespecting a murder victim for example, I'd say it's the T channels. And if somebody apologises and you don't like the fact that they apologised, why did you ask them to in the first place? You can argue their apology was insincere, too late or just a bad take in general. But if they've apologised, that should be the first step in the right direction, as with Repzilla being a great example. I mean to say, you can gather a gaggle of commentators together to address a controversial personal issue all you want, but why are you doing so? Do you genuinely care about holding the person accountable? I'm usually quite interested in looking at intention, and while you can never truly judge it if you're not constantly watching them like I am with Dan TDA, cracks can begin to show through your content or your tweets. Epically roasting somebody in your videos and ratioing them in your tweets can be cool and I encourage you to have fun on the internet, because at its core that's why gossip even exists. But you can't go out of your way to claim that you're trying to report in the news or save the good of the community through it. If your intentions are to get the bag, take accountability for that just as you would wish other people would do with other things. If you want to look like a credible news source, own up to your mistakes with glee and be proud of the fact that you've learned from it and that you're going to do better. As much as it pains me to give Deaf Noodles credit, he has actually apologised for his false accusations in the past. To his not so credit, he's still promoting the thread that includes these false accusations. What I'm saying here is that if you're trying to be a super credible news reporter, don't feed into the problem. Don't become the thing you swore to destroy, basically. Some what you need to set an example. If you're lambasting people for not taking accountability, or making 47 hour videos analysing how bad their apology was, why should anybody listen to you when you don't issue your apologies yourself or don't take accountability yourself? Hypocrisy is one of the easiest criticisms to make of somebody because there's no way to weasel your way out of it. If you were a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite. It's a universally agreed moral boundary, especially when it comes to spreading the news. People will go after Keemstar for letting his fans harass RSG Glory and Gold when he spread misinformation. Let me clarify, that was a horrifically large mistake made, but will simultaneously make huge mistakes in their own videos, but will refuse to correct them once they receive backlash for it, despite the false accusations being alive and well. At the end of the day, we've reached a point in the YouTube climate where taking accountability does little to nothing. People will harass you or attack you regardless. Those that enforce this accountability can't even take it themselves, and when they can't, misinformation is spread by not apologising for aspects of their mistakes. It's a gigantic loophole that so many commentators, news reporters, T-channels and even the audience seem to slip up on. And that is only been proven by the sheer length of this flippin' video. <laughs> One of the many things that both excited and concerned me whilst making this video was the number of examples I added in the middle of production due to better and better examples becoming apparent after the script's completion. Hence the weird variations in audio throughout this video. Even though I knew how much of a problem it was before making this video, I truly did not understand how big of a problem it was until I noted down 15 extra examples to include. Most of which are lost to time unfortunately because my microphone is not working. This is an infestation of ill intent, tomfoolery and annoyance that plagues all communities involved in internet drama. This is not only the tea or commentary community, there are too many others to include. In many ways, content creators pretend that they're saving the community by ending a serious problem by regurgitating information that somebody's a racist or something along those lines in spite of millions of apologies. No matter who it is or what they do, there will always be gremlins to tower in and say that it wasn't a good enough apology. Of course, a lot of the time it isn't, I won't deny that. But people barely give the creator an opportunity to actually better themselves. I remember the content creator Nicholas Diorio frequently mentioning how you can only get cancelled if you cancel yourself. If you get into a controversy and leave the internet afterwards, that's on you. People claim that Keemstar, Ricegum and Logan Paul got cancelled, but that's not really the case, they're still frequently making content. They were exposed and still continued to thrive after their controversies. People such as Linemaker, Red Kiwis and Nairo can quite literally be exposed for inappropriate acts and still 
still hold a substantial audience because they continued uploading. The latter two still have hundreds of substantial content creators defending them, by the way. At the end of it, though, commentators will feed this illusion that they're saving the community by exposing people when in reality it actually does very little. In the same way, they'll try to expose people for completely irrelevant things that happened years ago just because they themselves want a little bit of that internet clout. If we address the elephant in the room here and ask, Well, what do you do then? You make videos criticizing people? Then maybe I haven't quite got my point across so eloquently. Making videos on people to critique them and assess their shortcomings is a good thing, don't get me wrong. Sometimes people need to be knocked down a peg. However, if you're really thinking that reading tarot cards to prove Eugenia Cooney's parents are abusive is a good idea, and you claim to be holding people accountable, then I think you missed the point. Eugenia's dad is a creep. People will take non-issues and pretend it's a big deal, but then will act all elitist in saying that they're saving the good of the community. And sure, I too have had this ego Statistical mindset before. But at the end of the day, you're making a 10 minute video about how Nikocado Avocado blew his nose on the wrong brand of tissue, and you will still claim to be holding people accountable. What's worse is that when you call people out on these redundant criticisms, they will double down until it's no longer the popular narrative, and then will either quit the internet entirely or actually apologize. People love to criticize others. I mean, heck, I made this extremely long video doing exactly that. Content creators would happily lambast anybody in a controversy as long as it isn't them. But as soon as it is them, well, then there it's an issue. As shown with Kai Weiser's complaints about harassment from commentary videos, when his videos have the exact same harassment effect. Drama channels, T channels, and commentary channels alike will all pretend that they're doing the absolute best to keep people accountable, to help the community, to help them understand the problematic individuals. However, that is simply not the case. A lot of the time, they are doing nothing more than gaining views for themselves and doing nothing more than laughing at dirtbags, often with a very little justified reason. You can't exactly make a video grandstanding about race racism only to be enacting in racist conflict in private yourself. It becomes disingenuous. Why are you holding these people accountable when you're doing the same thing? Is this only for views? That's fine, but you can't grandstand about issues that you yourself get involved in. When you throw a punch, you've got to be able to catch that punch back. But the reality is, not many creators can actually do that. Apologize or not, there are still a hundred layers to the conflict to be unfolded. Because of this, when you do something wrong, you just have to sit and hope for the best. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the facade of YouTubers taking a Accountability. Man, I'm so sorry, and I've really let a lot of people down.